keep the enemies attacking you rather than your allies, and survive those attacks. Those are the only two things you have to worry about as a tank in D&D. And frankly, this pretty much applies to every traditional setup of a party. Somebody's the tank, somebody's the healer, and then everybody else is just supposed to be doing tons of damage. That's how it's usually supposed to work. And there's a great reason for this, because the focused roles make you super efficient at taking down enemies. But here's the thing, pretty much every melee focused class in D&D can tank to some degree. But we're not looking for the ability to tank, we're looking for the best tank. So let's run through them really fast. Rangers can be in melee, they can self-heal, and they have a decent amount of spells to help control the battlefield, but they're rangers. So if you're looking for something optimal, it's not them. Hexblade Warlocks can do some cool stuff, but in order to mitigate the damage, they have to use one of their very precious spell slots to cast shield, or they have to be all the way at 10th level. Then they have to have an enemy that's targeted by their Hexblade's curse, and then they have to use their reaction to use their armor of hexes to have a 50% chance at ignoring all damage from an attack, which is a lot of hoops to jump through all the way at 10th level, so that's definitely not optimal. Sorcerers don't usually have a melee build. Wizards do have their blade singing subclass, but if anything does damage them, they have a very tiny health pools, so probably best to avoid wizards altogether. Clerics have the super tanky forge cleric, but they don't have quite as much battlefield control. Moon druids can shapeshift for basically unending amounts of health, but they don't really have a whole lot of ways to encourage the enemies at attacking them, other than the fact that they're just a big ass bear. Rogues do have the swashbuckler rogue, which is all about one-on-one -on -one fighting, but if there's ever more than one enemy, they're kind of screwed. Both Valor and Swords Bards do have some options, but again, they're not optimal when it comes to tanking. Monk is even an interesting option because they have two great subclasses when it comes to tanking. Way of the Open Hand is great with battlefield control, and Way of the Long Death is basically unkillable, at least as long as they have some key points left. And they're still able to control the battlefield with stunning strike, but that relies on constitution saving throws, and by the time you get to mid-levels, usually most things are going to be able to beat a con save, because a dragon or a giant is going to have plenty of constitution. That leaves us with the big three tanks. Both fighters and barbarians are tanks in very similar ways, but at the same time, the exact opposite. Fighters use really high armor class to survive getting hit because then they don't actually take damage. And then they use things like the fighting style protection to help impose disadvantage on their allies that are next to them being attacked. Or they use the battle master maneuver, goading attack to help encourage enemies to attack them because they're gonna have disadvantage on attacking anybody else. Meanwhile, the barbarian is all about having a a crap ton of health and being resistant to most of the damage rather than having a bunch of armor to mitigate getting hit at all. And rather than impose disadvantage on attacking their allies, it's more about encouraging enemies to attack them with advantage Come on, kill me, I'm here! because they get to use reckless attack which is a core mechanic of being a barbarian, and it's what leads them to be more of a tank. They mitigate the damage with resistance by going into rage, they can have resistance to even more damage by being a totem barbarian, and they can also mitigate more damage against their allies by being an ancestral guardian barbarian. However, both the barbarian and the fighter have the exact same problem. Just imposing advantage or disadvantage means that you're relying on the dungeon master to remember it. And not only that, if they're getting really deep in the roleplay, Playing, it can be very difficult to manage this. For most dungeon masters, it's like fitting together the perfect puzzle. They have to figure all the specific pieces, and then they're going to remember, hey, this person has advantage. This person has disadvantage. I'm going to make sure that this enemy is attacking them for that reason. But in actuality, it's pure chaos. And they might even be overthinking it. They're trying to overanalyze and think, hey, does this hobgoblin have an idea that they would have advantage on this attack or disadvantage on that attack? And are they so smart that they realize that that's actually a battle strategy so maybe they would ignore it and then you start thinking way too many levels deep and before you know it you just kind of forget about half of it and then you just wind up attacking whoever's closest to you anyways but there's a way to get around all of this and we're going to do it by going with a paladin. Not just that, but there's a very specific paladin that is the absolute perfect tank. So let's just go ahead and dive in. First things first, we gotta pick a race. So we're gonna choose the human variant. This allows us to pick up a feat right at first level. And we're gonna pick up the perfect feat for anybody that wants to be a tank. 
Sentinel. Sentinel has three key features. First off, when they make an opportunity attack against an enemy trying to get away, when they hit them, their speed becomes zero, meaning they don't get to run anymore. So those enemies are stuck pretty close to you unless they try and use the disengage action. Oh wait, they don't get to use the disengage action because of part number two. You can still attack enemies even if they use the disengage action. And then finally, to encourage attacking you even more than your allies, if they do attack your ally and they're within five feet of you, you get to use your reaction to get another attack against them. Being a human variant also gives you a free skill. But between the race, the class, and the background, there's only four skills that really matter when it comes to being a tank. There's this stuff for encouraging enemies to attack you, so you're going to want probably intimidation and persuasion. Then to deal with any grappling that might happen, you want good athletics, and just to be aware of your surroundings, you also want perception. So you can get those from your race, your background, or your class, but I'm not going to force you down one route, but if you want to know what I would choose, just check my Patreon where I have all the character sheets to these builds. Now it's time to jump to those stats. This is all about being an optimal build, so obviously we're going to min-max it. When it comes to using point buy in 5th edition, you can put 15 points into 3 different scores, but forcing you to dump the rest. So we're just going to focus on the stats that matter to a paladin. We're going to put 15 points into strength, constitution, and charisma, dumping the rest down to 8, and then we have 2 bonus points we can use because we chose to be a variant human. So we're going to put them in constitution and charisma, because we're not touching strength anymore for the rest of this build. Don't worry, I'll tell you why in just a second. Now let's go ahead and dive into the class. You're going to be starting as a paladin, but don't worry, we're going to do a bit of a multi-class later. Paladins get saving throws and wisdom and charisma, which wisdom is going to be pretty darn helpful because there's plenty of wisdom saves in D&D, and you get proficiency in all armor and all weapons. So you're going to want the heaviest armor you can possibly get, eventually getting plate armor, which requires that 15 in strength, and that's the only reason we put those points there, eventually leading you to 20 armor class between plate armor and a shield, and then you're going to want to make sure you grab a war hammer. Like I said, we're doing a completely optimal build, and bludgeoning is the best normal damage type in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, for one main reason. That's right, you need to be crushing some zombie heads. Plenty of early level undead are vulnerable to bludgeoning damage, so we need to be able to use this to our advantage. Now that we have all the basics out of the way, it's time to dive into the aspects of the class. At first level of Paladin, you get Divine Sense, so you can literally smell evil around you if you want to, and you'll be able to identify fiends and undead and things like that. Also, to help your survivability, you get Lay on Hands, allowing you to heal yourself or allies for five times your paladin level. And if you use at least five of those points at once, you can neutralize a poison or a disease. Then at second level of paladin, you get a fighting style. And while defense is actually a great option if you have all ranged damage dealers, I'm gonna assume that you have somebody else in melee with you. So we're gonna take the protection fighting style. This means that if you have an ally within five feet of you that gets attacked, you can put your shield in front of them forcing disadvantage on the enemy attacking them. Also at second level of Paladin, you get some spell casting, but we're gonna save that spell casting for just a second because there's two very important spells that you want early on, and we have a way to get them without taking up any of your known spells. But if you don't wanna use your spell slots for actually casting spells, you can also smack a bit harder with Divine Smite, allowing you to add 2d8 damage to a melee attack and an additional 1d8 for every spell slot above the first level. Then at third level of Paladin, you get divine health, making you immune to disease, and you get to choose a sacred oath, otherwise known as a subclass. And this is where we get to choose the perfect paladin subclass for tanking. And that would be the Oath of the Crown. When you choose the Oath of the Crown, you are all about protecting your allies. And that's exemplified even with the spells that you get for free, because you get the two best early level spells for tanks. Compelled to duel and command. Compelled to duel makes it so enemies just can't really run away from you and command allows you to literally order somebody to come towards you if you want or grovel or drop their weapon or whatever. But even better than those spells, Oath of the Crown Paladins get their channel divinity and they can use it for one of two options. If your allies do get hurt because you're not doing your job properly, you can use Turn the Tide. So each creature of your choice that can hear you within 30 feet of you regains hit points equal to 1d6 plus your charisma modifier. But the better choice for a tank is using the other channel divinity option, 
Champion Challenge. So as a bonus action, every creature of your choice within 30 feet of you has to make a Wisdom saving throw. And if they fail, they can't move more than 30 feet away from you. They don't get to keep redoing this save, they're just stuck which is so incredibly powerful for tanking. And they make that save against your Charisma DC. So when we get to fourth level of Paladin, when we get an ability score improvement, we're gonna put two more points into our Charisma, really focusing on it. Then at fifth level of Paladin, you get the all important for any melee class, extra attack. But also you get access to second level spell slots. So you can use that for stronger Divine Smites or some more actual spell casting. Then at sixth level of Paladin, you get Aura of Protection. So there's one big downside to dumping all the other stats that we did, which is that you're gonna suck at the saving throws. But thanks to Aura of Protection, you and any creature within 10 feet of you, at least as long as you're conscious, gets to add your Charisma modifier to every saving throw. Meaning that you are at least decent at pretty much every save, which is very helpful, especially for a tank. Then at seventh level of Paladin, you get another feature from Oath of the Crown, Divine Allegiance. So if you do have an ally within five feet of you that does take some damage because, well, it's gonna happen, you can use your reaction to magically substitute your health for their health. So you wind up taking the damage instead of them. The only caveat is that you can't reduce this damage in any way. So if you're resistant to fire damage and they take fire damage, you still have to take the full damage even though you're resistant to it. Then at 8th level of Paladin, you get another ability score improvement. So we're going to go ahead and max out your Charisma, bringing it to 20. Then at 9th level of Paladin, you get access to 3rd level spell slots. And this is going to be super important thanks to the spells that you get from being an Oath of the Crown. Because you get Aura of Vitality, which basically allows you to just keep healing members of your party as long as they're close to you, which is nice, but more importantly as a tank, you get the best tanking spell in D&D, Spirit Guardians. Spirit Guardians makes a 15-foot aura around you that deals 3d8 radiant or necrotic damage just constantly. It only targets the people that you want it to target, and it's just a constant damaging aura just surrounding you within 15 feet. And even if your enemies wind up succeeding on the saving throw, they still take half damage. But on top of that, it's also considered difficult terrain, so they're at half speed within that aura. So in case you're not hitting them with Sentinel, reducing their speed to zero, their speed is already cut in half because they're in this aura, and even if they get outside of that 15 feet, they're still stuck in the 30 foot range thanks to Champion Challenge. So they're stuck in a circle, and then inside that circle, there's an aura of damage, and then if they're too close to you, you just get to hit them, making it that much more fun. But you may be wondering at this point, well, actually getting the chance to hit them is a little hard since my strength is kind of lacking at this point. Don't worry, we get to tackle that because of a multi-class that we're gonna do right now. Instead of taking 10th level in Paladin, we're gonna be jumping over to Warlock. When you take your first level in Warlock, you get an otherworldly patron right away, otherwise known as a subclass. And we're gonna choose a Hexblade. I know I mentioned that Hexblades aren't the best tanks, but we've already taken care of all of the tank stuff we need. Now we get to focus on the bonus stuff and we didn't even get halfway to max level, which is why this build makes such good tanks because it starts working very early on. So when you decide to be a Hexblade, you get Hexblade's Curse. So you can curse an enemy and you get to crit when you hit that enemy when you score a 19 or a 20, essentially doubling your crit range and you get to add your proficiency bonus to any damage that you deal against that enemy. Then finally, if you defeat that enemy, you get hit points equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. But even more importantly than any of that is that you also get Hex Warrior when you choose to be a Hexblade. So now you can use your Charisma modifier for any of your melee weapon attacks, meaning that it's even better that we didn't waste any more points into Strength. Also at first level of Warlock you get some spell casting, and these spell slots recharge on a short rest, but they're very restricted into the amount of spell slots you get, and what level they're at. Hexblade does give you access to shield in case you need to block one big attack coming at you and your 20 armor class isn't gonna be enough, boosting you to 25 armor class just for that turn, but you also get some cantrips being a warlock. And there's three very important ones we're gonna want. We'll want sword bursts that we can damage around yourself, basically making it so now inside of that 15 foot damage aura that you already have, if anybody's right next to you, you can damage all of them at once. You're also gonna wanna grab Booming Blade because then you can smack somebody so hard that it has some reverberating damage and if they decide to move, they take extra damage on top of that. But on top of everything else, you're gonna wanna get the tried and true Warlock Cantrip 
Eldritch Blast. You only get two cantrips at this level, but you will get that third cantrip later. Then at second level of Warlock, you get some Eldritch Invocations. And this is where we start getting a little more tricky. Because I didn't want to just give up on all the tank stuff, we still need more battlefield control. And we're going to do that with our Eldritch Blasting. Because we've now hit 11th level, which means three beams that come out from your Eldritch Blast. And to get some more battlefield control, we're going to get Repelling Blast and Grasp of Hadar. Repelling Blast allows you to push an enemy 10 feet away from you, with every single beam that comes out, which is insanely powerful, especially if you've played Baldur's Gate 3, you can basically push enemies off the map constantly and it's super overpowered. But when it comes to dealing with an enemy and making sure that you stay between them and the party, you can just make sure that they're constantly staying away. It's pretty helpful. But if an enemy is trying to run away from you, you can also use Grasp of Hadar, which you can only use once per turn, but allows you to pull an enemy 10 feet closer to you. Get over! Then at third level of Warlock, you get a Pact Boon. So, of course, we're going to take Pact of the Blade. It just makes it so that bludgeoning damage you're already dealing, now it's magical bludgeoning damage, so you can overcome more resistances. Also at this level, your Warlock spell slots upgrade to second level. Then at fourth level of Warlock, you get an ability score improvement. So we're going to boost up our health a decent amount by taking the Feet Tough. This Feet gives us an extra two hit points per level of this overall build. Also at 4th level, you finally get that 3rd cantrip that you wanted to get anyways. Then at 5th level of Warlock, your spell slots upgrade to 3rd level, and you get one more Eldritch Invocation. So we're gonna grab Eldritch Smite. So now you can smack a creature and smite them with your Divine Smite, while at the same time hitting them with your Eldritch Smite, because these two abilities can stack. Eldritch Smite deals 1d8 force damage to your melee attack, and an extra 1d8 per level of this spell slot used for it. But you can only use this once per turn. But on top of that, just to help your overall tanking, in case we weren't focusing on it enough, using an Eldritch Smite knocks a creature prone if it's huge or smaller. No save, no nothing, just automatically knocked prone. Which means that their speed is automatically cut in half if they decide to try and get up. And if their speed's already cut in half there, it's cut in half again because they're in difficult terrain from your spirit guardians. Then at 6th level warlock you get another feature from being a hexblade, you get a cursed specter. So if you slay an enemy, their spirit rises up to fight alongside you. And this is mostly just to give your enemies one more target other than you and your allies, which basically helps tanking a little more. Then at 7th level of Warlock, your spell slots upgrade to 4th level, and you get another Eldritch Invocation. And I want to make sure that we're not going to lose concentration on our very valuable Spirit Guardians. So we're going to take Eldritch Mind, giving us advantage on Constitution saving throws to maintain concentration on spells. Then at 8th level of Warlock, we get another Ability Score Improvement. So let's go ahead and throw two more points into our Constitution, helping our Constitution saving throws, and at the same time, helping our health. Then at 9th level of Warlock, our Warlock spell slots upgrade to 5th level, and we get one more Eldritch Invocation. And there's a few good options, but frankly, I hate when an enemy's getting away despite all of the things that you put in place to make sure they don't. So, we're gonna make sure that you can teleport to them with Relentless Hex. So if you have Hexblade's Curse active on an enemy, you can teleport up to 30 feet to get right next to them so they're not getting away from you. And if they're the big bad guy and they turn around and try and hit you for coming after them, you can use the 10th level feature you get from being a Hexblade, armor of hexes. So if an enemy that's cursed by your Hexblade's curse tries to hit you, you can use your reaction to roll a d6. And if you roll a 4 or higher, you just get to completely ignore the damage from that attack. And that means you have a 50% chance to take zero damage. Then we have one more level to play around with. And I was thinking about going fighter because then you get a fighting style and be able to maybe boost your armor class with defense. But it's better to probably stick with Warlock because we're going to get a Mystic Arcanum, which is a six level spell that we can cast once per long rest. And we're going to take one of the most powerful spells as long as you can get a little creative, Mass Suggestion. So you can take a huge group of people and command them to do what you want them to do. It can save your entire party, or if you just want to flex your abilities as a tank, you can say, come at me, bro, and they will all attack you instead of your allies. This is an absolutely great spell because it doesn't use concentration, and it's still super powerful and lasts up to 24 hours. That brings us to 20th level overall. You are insanely tanky. You have a circle of you're not getting away from me. And inside of that, you have a circle of damage. And even smaller than that, you have your own little smiting damage of destruction. Being able to stack your Eldritch Smite and your Divine Smite 
for some insane damage on top of the spirit guardians you already have up and running. Let me know what you think about this build in the comments down below, whether you have a better tank build that you have in mind, or if there's anything you tweak about this to make something a little better, let me know down there. And this whole build happened because somebody commented on one of my videos a while back saying that tanks don't exist in D&D, and I wanted to prove them wrong so badly that I went on a tangent about it and recorded this for whatever reason. After, of course, I put it up to a vote over on Patreon, where people get access to the character sheets, vote on future builds, and plenty of other random perks. And a special thank you to my player character patrons, Godzilla Khan, Robert McKibben, Jensen Santiago, Mugen, Elisa Martinez, Anthony McDonald, Panda Milkshake, Alistar Nix, Ted Z, Digimit, Andrew Nobles, Melinda's Robinson, Karkat Kitsune, Z13, Viral Naravar, Kesta, The Dino 21, Chris Moat, and Benjamin. Then going above and beyond that is my Dungeon Master level patrons that I actually to play D&D with. Daniel Sweeten, Conman ZX, Cyber Society, Talon Starkey, Demiurge, Brayden Aldridge, Daniel Galvin, Michael, Eric Wade, Salvador, and Kilo Kilo. Then going above and beyond anything I ever expected is my god tier level patron, Gamestake. So a very special thank you to him because he really contributes a lot to this channel. Finally, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, let me know by hitting that like button, and I'll be here hoping to roll at least three nat 20s in your next D&D session, especially if you want to be the ultimate tank in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition.